Hello, and welcome to Creepy Core and Folklore, the show about creatures, encounters, old tales, and myths. I'm your host, Iona Wayland, a dark fantasy author, mental health professional, and overall curious person. I want to join other spooky souls and hear about these unusual stories. Hello, spooky soul, and welcome to Creepy Core and Folklore, episode 37. Um, It's April now. This will be the first full week of April. Um, And so that saying, April showers bring May flowers popped into mind. And I thought, why not have an entire episode dedicated to the language of flowers? Um, And because we can like you know, expect many fun spring things now, baby animals, new blooms. And before we get into it a little bit more, I have some fun spring sayings uh, before we get into the like the common flowers and the meanings behind them related to springtime. So weirdly, these are from uh, like a person who lives in Appalachia. And I was really surprised that I'd never heard any of these, none of these. So you tell me if you've heard any of these sayings. The first one is wash hair in March rain water for pretty locks. I thought that was interesting. Never mix April 30th milk with May 1st milk or your butter will be slow in coming. So I think that one's also interesting. (laughs) If you get your head wet with the first rain of May, you won't have a headache all year long. I'm going to try that one. (laughs) If you wash your face in dew on the 1st of May, you will be pretty. I think that's also that has some like magical sounds to it. When April blows its horn, it's good for hay and corn. So I think that's kind of fun, too. I think it's just like prepare for the the rebirth and recycle of in, new growth and like harvesting and things like that. And then this author wrote, poorer than a crow in spring, as thin as a whippoorwill in spring. Um, I still don't know what kind of bird the whippoorwill is, but it has a very unique call. It sounds like it's saying the word whippoorwill. Let me try and find it. Okay, total side note. These birds are freaking adorable. They look like a dragon. It's very weird to me. They have like a lizard type of look because of the way their feathers lay, but also in certain, like they obviously have really good camouflage because the way their feathers are plated like this almost, it looks like a pile of leaves or something. It's so interesting. This is so interesting. I'm going to try and find uh, a bird call for you so that you can hear what they sound like because they're very, very recognizable. Like not sight wise. It's no wonder I've never seen one. They camouflage like a pile of leaves or sticks, but the sound is super recognizable. But I thought that was really interesting because it's kind of like they're saying whip or will, whip or will, whip or will. So I thought those were like some fun little sayings. Let me know if you've heard of any of them before because I really haven't. Maybe it's a more Southern thing. I'm not sure. Or a certain part of Appalachia. But I thought those were kind of some neat like wives tales or sayings. So let's go over these spring flowers and some of the stories behind them. I'm so excited because this talks about little flowers, which of course is lovely to start focusing on and recognizing when they're starting to grow. But then also some of them get into like how colors symbolize different things. And I thought that was interesting too. So first up, we have the traditional daffodils. Apparently they're like genus name I forget how that goes but is narcissus but I was like that's interesting because that's like the root of narcissist or narcissist like the the story of like being you know stuck on yourself kind of thing not trying to villainize narcissism or anything it's just you know I thought that was interesting because they have a unique look they have like a bright or pale yellow petals with like a trumpet like like a circular petals on the inside of it um, kind of in the middle and they grow from a bulb and that makes them very hardy and they grow back each year 
Um, but they're supposed to symbolize new beginnings and rebirth. Um, and in China, they're seen as good fortune. They're the official symbol of the Lunar New Year. And if you're curious about this Lunar New Year, I have a an episode all about the uh, Lunar Water Rabbit episode. It's because this year is the year of the Water Rabbit. It's also said that if you want to give daffodils to someone, you can't just give one. If you give one, it's considered bad a luck. You have to give them like a bouquet of them or several. Um, in the UK, it said that, quote, good weather won't arrive until the last daffodil has died. And I think that just shows that spring has kind of ended and that summer is coming. They're the national flower of Wales as well. And some people call them the, quote, Lent lily, uh, end quote, because, you know, Lent happens around um, before Easter. So the springtime blooms line up. Um, they're considered rare in Wales because their habitat is being destroyed. Uh, in Welsh, their name roughly translates to St. Peter's Leek. Um, and they were said to have been worn on St. David's Day uh, because it was apparently St. David ordered his soldiers to wear, quote, leeks during battle. So that kind of adds to the leek mythology of it. Next up, we have the beautiful tulips. These also grow as bulbs. They are these like bright, vibrant colors. They grow upward on like a thick or circular like stalk. And then they have basically like a cup of petals at the top. It's so cute. They are the third most popular flower. I did not know that. First are roses, second are chrysanthemums, and the third po most popular is what we're talking about, the tulips. There are different meanings of the tulip depending on their color. So red tulips mean true love. Pink tulips mean happiness, good wishes, and attachment. Purple tulips represent royalty. White tulips represent forgiveness, spiritual love, and pure intention. Yellow tulips represent cheerful thoughts. Next up is the pansy. In French, their name means thought, um, like thoughtfulness or in your thoughts. It's supposed to symbolize remembrance. Um, and it's really cute. They kind of look like a little face. It's very, very sweet. Um, they're considered a nostalgic love flower. They're also February's birth flower. And they also, I've always seen them as like purple or blue or like I don't know, like purple or blue, really, the, the cool colors. But apparently, they show up in many, many different ways. So yellow, which I've never seen before, um, that not that I can recall, stands for happiness, positive energy, and joy. Blue stands for honesty and loyalty. White stands for innocence and purity. Orange stands for love and passion. Purple is, again, royalty, nobility, and beauty. And red stands for love and affection. Side note, I stopped recording for a second because I'm right next door. Like I have the door open and stuff, but I'm right next to where the babo is. And like in, she's in the living room. And I thought I heard her crying, but it was like kind of weird sounding. So I was like, oh, are you calling for me? Like it wasn't sad sounding. It was just kind of like curious sounding. And so I popped my head over and she's singing to Frozen. <laughs> It's just her singing. It's so cute. She's been singing more lately and it just like melts my heart. But let's get back into these flower symbolisms. Okay, so we've got primrose. Um, it's a little white flower. Very cute. It's supposed to represent young love, youth, new beginnings, new life or birth. So it has lots of like newness to it. Blue bells, which are very cute. They're so cute. They look like little, well, they look like bells um, or little hats with stems. Um, and it was funny because I was I was like, wow, I think I've seen that before, like with like uh, art depicting fairies wearing like a bloom hat. And it turns out that they're considered fairy flowers. So it's said that they can summon fairies to a meeting. It's supposed to represent humility constancy, gratitude, and everlasting love. Next one up makes me sad. It's the lilac. Um, so 
Unfortunately, I am horrifically allergic, but they're so beautiful. Um, There was this time where I was like kind of sunbathing and just like taking in nature. And I felt like, you know, there's like pollen floating everywhere and petals and there were bees all over and it smelled so freaking good. And then the next day I could like barely breathe and everything was stopped up. So I'm like horrifically allergic to lilacs and I learned the very, very hard way. But the ones that are fragrant are only like you can only smell them for about three weeks. Um, It's supposed to represent renewal and confidence. And it's suggested as a graduation gift, though I'm not sure why. Maybe it's like, you know, you're going to start your new life and you got to start it with confidence after you graduate or something. I'm not sure. Next up is the iris. These are beautiful. They have a very unique look. It's almost like they look like they're turning themselves inside out. It's very cool. Um, The petals kind of like fall over the side like a waterfall, but they're a symbol of royalty. And they also can represent faith, hope, wisdom, and valor. And I just want to point out the, the article didn't talk about this but I just want to point out that iris or iris it's spelled the same thing but iris in Spanish means rainbow next up has a lot of folklore behind it it's called the snowdrop these also look like little white bells but they're more like circular um or like uh like orbs and they bloom in early spring Hence the name, because sometimes whenever they bloom, they can bloom when there's still snow on the ground. It's supposed to represent hope, rebirth, purity, and consolation. There's a horrifying poem that goes with them um, by Christina Rossetti, and it goes, Baby lies so fast asleep that we cannot wake her. Will the angels clad in white fly from heaven to take her? Baby lies so fast asleep that no pain can grieve her. Put a snowdrop in her hand, kiss her once, and leave her. That, I don't know, that makes me very unsettled. I don't like it. Um, But we'll get more into why maybe there's some, like, darker imagery with it or, like, unsettling imagery with it. They're an alpine plant. Um, They're said to be a part of the lore of, quote, how the snow got its color, end quote. Um, And so the story goes, when the very, very first snow of all time fell, it had no color at all. And it would go to the different flowers to ask them to share their color with it because it didn't want to be colorless anymore. And all of them turned their backs out of like arrogance and pride. Um, And they didn't want to share those colors. But the snowdrop kind of like took pity on the snow and was loving and giving and shared their white color with the snow. And in return, the snow gave snowdrops their protection to bloom in the cold. And so that's why it said like snow is white and then these snowdrops are able to bloom even when there's like frost or snow on the ground. It's also called the quote, fair maid of February, which I think is really cute. And in Welsh, uh, it's roughly translated to snow lily. There's this other association with them. This is where we get to the creepy side of things. They're associated with death because not only are they a really common graveyard, like a natural graveyard flower, there's also some that say that it looks like a corpse wearing a shroud. And it's considered bad luck to pick and bring it into the house. That's why the poem in the beginning really confused me. And I don't know, there's something off about it. So <laughs> that's that's the snowdrop. It has like a, a leery or eerie kind of vibe to it. Next up, we have the freesia. It This one's also bell shaped, but they reach upward. They're said to have a sweet citrus scent. And it's supposed to represent trust, friendship, and innocence. And it's such, I think that was really cute because it's like, that would be such a cute friendship gift. Like, oh, I want to get you flowers. I'm going to give you some freesias. Next one, this one's so gorgeous. Well, they're also gorgeous, but this one I, I really like a lot is the peony. They are just stunning. And I can still remember the very first time I saw one. I remember what a teeny tiny bud it had. And when it bloomed, there were so many layers and delicate ruffles. And I just I just remember like I I 
remember being really little and being like, what is that? And someone told me a peony and I was like, whoa. And they smell really good too. In China, they're considered, quote, king of flowers, end quote. And they're supposed to represent romance and prosperity. They're also said to symbolize good fortune, honor, compassion, and a happy marriage. And that makes sense to me, the happy marriage part, because I see peonies a lot more recently. They're really popular wedding bouquet, which I think is very classy. Next up, we have a lily of the valley. These are also adorable. I'm just going to call every single one adorable, but these are really cute. Um, They also look like little white bells and they're more circular in shape as well. They're more like orb like Um, and they're said to represent good luck and happiness. Next up is the azalea. They're pink and they usually have like five petals and they're supposed to represent love, gentleness, femininity, fragility, passion. Um, You can give them to somebody if you hope that they get better or that you want them to know that they're cared for, that you hope they're cared for. And they can also, I thought this was very interesting, they can be a symbol of being homesick and wishing to return. And so it can be something that's like, hey, I hope you're doing well. And also, you know, I miss you and I hope you come back or you can get it for yourself if you're feeling homesick and you want to return to somewhere. You can kind of give that gift of azaleas to yourself. Next up are hyacinths. I always confuse hyacinths with other things because of the clustering of the the blooms. Uh, but there's like a thick stalk with a bushel of like these periwinkle blooms at the top. Um, at least I'm used to seeing that periwinkle color, but apparently they can be many different colors. So purple, this is the first time I, I've seen purple not represent royalty. The purple hyacinth represents sorrow and forgiveness. White represents praying for or rooting for somebody. Yellow represents jealousy. So that was really interesting. I don't think I've ever seen a yellow hyacinth before. And red represents playtime and fun. Next up are marigolds, and they have a rich folkloric history. I didn't realize that there was more to them other than Dia de los Muertos, because that's what I'm used to seeing. And I actually named my car marigold because it's a bright orange. But these blooms look like a bright orange puff and are like very complex with their symbolism, it turns out. They're supposed to represent lost love and or feeling rejected. They can also symbolize a desire for wealth. So the article was talking about how like, if you give them to a friend, then it can mean that you want them to be successful and be wealthy. Or if you get them for yourself, you can kind of like, focus on your intention of making more money. So I thought that was interesting. It can also be given as a functional and healthy relationship present like for those established couples out there they'll like give each other marigolds as like uh recognizing how well they're going together and to celebrate the healthy time they've had with each other and then the last one that it listed was for uh, sacred offerings. And that's what I was talking about for Dia de los Muertos. And I know I talked about this in my Halloween-y episode, <laughs> all about the different ways across the world Halloween is celebrated. And I brought those up. But it also turns out that the marigold has really rich folklore and symbolism behind it uh, in the Aztec world, Buddhist world, Christian world, and Hindu world. Next up are zinnias. I had never seen these little flowers before, but they are absolutely stunning. Like they have such pops of like these really interesting, like almost like distressed colors. It's very unique circular stamen or pistol or both. I don't know. In the middle, they like shoot up and they're like in a little circle. It's very, very interesting. But they have a very interesting symbolism to them. One that's kind of like reminds me a little bit of the marigold, but they are supposed to represent an absent friend, Um, like a friend who isn't there for you, or you can get it for yourself if you're going through a friendship breakup. These three things kind of go together, but it can also represent affection, heart, and remembrance. So another intentional way you could get these flowers for yourself or for another person is that the person will always be in your thoughts and heart. And so I thought that was very beautiful and very poignant about the zinnias. 
And the last one I'm going to talk about today are dog violets. I adore violets. Um, I know I talked about how green and purple are my favorite colors. um, And that dark violet color is so beautiful. Um, But it's supposed to be a symbol of fertility. Um, Dog violets are the, quote, wild variant, end quote, of the sweet violet that I think more people are um, acquainted with. But if you like go in the walk on a walk in the woods, or at least where, where I am, you can see wild violets like the dog violets um, growing and they're very hardy. Um, in Ireland, they're called the cuckoo's foot or cockadoodle doo foot, basically, um, because there's a spur that grows on the back. And it kind it does kind of look like a chicken foot, like the petals, the way the petals are set up, it does look like a chicken foot. Um, The Victorian language of dog violets, it means that someone is admiring the person they're giving it to and that the person was feeling like they were falling in love with them. It's also said to represent humility or humbleness because of the quiet, unassuming beauty that it has. In Roman mythology, Apollo was advancing on one of Diana's nymphs. And so to protect her, she turned that nymph into a violet so that Apollo would stop his advance, the unwanted advances on her. Another um, part of mythology is that there was a mortal girl that was turned into a violet. But instead of this one being about protecting the person from unwanted advances, this was after like Venus beat her up and turned her into a violet because Cupid said that the mortal girl was more beautiful than Venus. But on the flip side, so those are some weird like, oh, these people, this nymph and this mortal girl were transformed into a violet. On the flip side, it's associated with luck and said to ward off evil spirits. So it's a very powerful flower, it sounds like. But that's it for the blooms, the common blooms in spring that I'm going to be covering today in this episode. I hope that your April has started off bloomingly. Make sure you smell the spring air, admire the new growth, and I will talk to you next week. Thanks to all you spooky souls out there for listening to Creepy Core and Folklore. Follow on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and TikTok if you're looking for more uncanny content. If you have your own tales to tell, you can email creepycoreandfolklore at gmail.com. If you liked this, please leave a review wherever you get your podcasts or tell a friend who might enjoy these stories to spread the word. If you're interested in dark fantasy, check out my Hollowverse series. Ashes is available now in paperback and ebook on Amazon and audiobook on Audible. And the sequel is underway. I'm Iona Wayland. And I'll see you next time.